let's talk about what ethical hacking is, first of all. So we're going to have an introduction right now. And part of this module, our goal is to, dis you'll be able to describe ethical hacking. You'll be able to explain its purpose and the components of information security, describe attack vectors and threat management, describe security policies and security controls, explain what a vulnerability assessment is, and describe a few laws related to information security. So our topics are information security overview, information security threats and attack vectors, hacking concepts, types, and phases, ethical hacking concepts and scope, information security controls, penetration testing concepts, and information security laws and standards. So let's start with just what is information security. Let's talk about some terminology and the elements and the security and functionality and usability of it. So what are we talking about? Information security, right? So we're talking about trying to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your information that's made available through systems and your network and applications. So the CIA, Confidentiality, Integrity, Availability, that is the bedrock foundation of everything you do in information security. So this, these three together are called the CIA triangle or triad. And the problem is, is that they, they go together, but availability is always in a tug of war against confidentiality and integrity. Now confidentiality means that only authorized persons can see this data or access this system or access this network. Only authorized people can see it, can read it, can access it. Integrity means that the system or the data has not had unauthorized modifications. Generally, it's hard to have integrity without also confidentiality. They, they go hand in hand. So confidentiality, you must be authorized to see or access this system or data. Integrity, this thing has not been changed in an unauthorized manner. Availability, though, is at the other end. Availability means that this data, this system, this network is available for use as authorized users need it. Because the more secure you get, the harder it is intrinsically for people to get to it. If you encrypt it where no one can read it, that's great, but then no one can read it. So availability is always at odds with confidentiality and integrity. That's one thing that you're always constantly trying to juggle and balance. Now let's talk about some other terminology. Risk, vulnerability, threat. Let's start with those. Okay, so what's the difference? You need to know the difference. A threat, a vulnerability, they sound similar. They're not exactly the same. A vulnerability is a weakness. It's a weakness. Now, could that weakness be taken advantage of? Maybe, maybe not. Depends upon your how, how many safeguards you have in place. A threat is something, a person or a natural circumstance or a um, group of people or uh, some kind of attack, a threat is something that could take advantage of a weakness, that um, it now becomes a realistic possibility. So you've got a weakness, a vulnerability that might be protected so that nobody can actually make a threat against it. So you've got vulnerability and threat. Risk is the probability that the threat will actually get to the vulnerability. So you need to make a distinction between those three things. Risk is the probability that a threat can take advantage of or exploit a weakness. And when we talk risk, we're generally talking about probability and impact. So when we do risk analysis, we say, what is the probability of this happening? And what is the impact in case it does happen? And um, when we do risk assessment, which is not part of this class, but you need to be aware of it, um, we, we examine every possible vulnerability and every possible threat. And we say, okay, 
the, uh, what's the risk of the threat of a virus getting into our system? Well, in one year, uh, on a scale of one to 10, maybe a seven. I mean, this, you, you get a bunch of people together to give your opinion, give their opinion on this. Okay, and if that happened, typical virus, what's the impact on a scale of one to 10? Oh, a four. Okay, well, with 10 times 10 being the worst, being you know the probability and the impact, uh, that's on a, now 100. Probability, we said seven, impact four, that's 28 on 100. And you would go through every single possible vulnerability and threat and do a risk analysis. So risk is um, the probability that a threat will take advantage or exploit a vulnerability. Now, a, a non-repudiation, another term we need to know about, non-repudiation means that I can't deny that I did something. And when we talk about in cryptography, we'll get into that more and, and we use digital signatures to um, uh, enforce non-repudiation. So non-repudiation, I cannot repudiate, I cannot deny I did something. The term control means your safeguard. And a control can be all kinds of things from an administrative policy. So you would start with some kind of information security policy. And that would be an administrative control that basically drives everything else. So it could be a policy. A control could be a policy. A control could be a lock on a door. It could be uh, cameras and fences and guards and dogs and um, lighting. It could be antivirus, firewalls, access control, patches. Um, uh, it could be um, uh, password policies, like um, you have to have at least eight characters in complex, um, or it could be authentication tokens. Whether it's physical, logical, or administrative, uh, if you can put it in place somehow to try to minimize your risk, that's a control. And then finally, we have the idea of mitigate. Mitigation or mitigate means to minimize or reduce. You cannot fully have a secure network. I mean, you want to have a secure system? Don't have a system. I mean, it's not practical or reasonable to think you can be fully risk-free. You can't. You just have to bring risk to an acceptable, tolerable level. And by implementing cost-effective mitigations or controls to reduce the risk and bring them to an acceptable level. And then anything that you can't afford or that is unforeseen falls below that line and you just have a backup plan. You have a contingency in case there's a worst case scenario. So that is some terminology we need to know right away. Let's also talk about these things, the hack value. We've already talked about vulnerability. The hack value is what is the value to the hacker? I mean, hackers have a lot of reasons for doing things. Sometimes it's just bragging rights. Sometimes it's just because they're curious. Sometimes they are a nation state actor or a terrorist group that have a really specific purpose and they could be well-funded. So what is the value of this target to someone? The value to a hacker may be very different from the value to you as a business. So that's, we're talking the value to the hacker, the hack value. There's the vulnerability. Like I said, a vulnerability is a weakness and it's a weakness either inherent in the design or in the implementation. So like, I'll give you a quick example, um, WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy, which was for the longest time what we used for encryption for wireless devices, is no longer considered secure. We should use WPA2 instead. What makes WEP insecure, among many reasons, is um, it uses a weak implementation of the RC4 encryption algorithm. Not that RC4 is necessarily weak in and of itself, not by design, but its implementation in WEP is um, weak. They use um, something that has a statistical bias, which means you don't have to capture that many packets to be able to figure out the password. So um, vulnerability could be weakness in design or implementation or both. Exploit, this is the actual uh, attack that breaches the system. So when I am a threat, when I'm a hacker, and I discover a vulnerability, I need to see if there's an exploit I can use against the vulnerability. 
because often there will be vulnerabilities and there's no available exploit for me to use to actually take advantage of it. So exploits are usually some kind of attack and typically they use code or uh, something, but they could be physical or they could be social engineering. Uh, so if it's, if it's a, a way for me as a threat to actively take advantage of a vulnerability, that's an exploit. Payload, now this is part of the exploit code. So um, when we're hacking and penetration testing, when you're an ethical hacker, uh, you will work and use the very same tools as the bad guys. You have to. I mean, you have to uh, use the exact same tools as them. You can't just be la la along. You have, to, you have to be as nasty as they are. However, you have good intent and you will make sure that you do everything possible to not actually damage the systems. You're there to try to find out the, the issues so they can be fixed before the bad guys really can do it themselves. So when you do this, the exploit is what breaks into the system. The payload is the thing you actually execute in the system once you've broken in. So as a sort of an analogy, um, an exploit would be like kicking in a door. That's the exploit. The ability that the door is weak enough that I can kick it in or I can break a window. I can get in. The payload is what I throw in once I've broken my way into the building. So the exploit could be kicking in the door. The payload could be throwing in a grenade. The grenade is the thing that actually does the damage. The payload actually does the damage. Now, I have to tell you, exploits in and of themselves can do damage. Just the sheer act of kicking in the door can break things. And so that's a risk also. Payloads, once we throw in, we toss in the grenade or whatever it is we're tossing in, payloads allow us to do what we really want to do. Steal data, um, destroy a system, uh, um, uh, maybe uh, modify or uh, change or uh, deface a website um, or change configurations or leave a back door so I can keep coming back in. These are all the payloads of possible exploits. A zero day attack. A zero day attack is um, any kind of attack, any kind of exploit that we have never seen before. It's not common knowledge and there's no patch for it. There's no antivirus update for it yet. <laughs> so every time something new comes out, um, if it's already being used by hackers, then the security community figures it out. Then the vendors create their patches for it. But you've got this unfortunate set of people who are the victim of the O-Day, O-Day or Zero-Day attack. Um, so, and there's no patch for them. So that's that thing that falls below the line of what you were expecting in your, your risk assessment. So when you have a zero day attack, the question is, is how do you now recover? Daisy chaining, um, we will maybe use multiple attacks um, to either uh, do multiple things or we'll use the same information for multiple networks. So daisy chaining simply means I'm using multiple exploits one after another. Um, Doxing, I am publishing personally identifiable information. So I've got everybody, I've got everyone's social security number. I've got some personally identifiable information. I'm going to publish it now on the web. And bot, this is an application that is remotely controlled. So a very common um, purpose of having these viruses is to turn your machine into a zombie that's part of a bot army. And then that bot and all the bots, the thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines that have been infected, they're running fine, but in the background, they've got one little bot, one little zombie that's running that is waiting for a command. And the command and control usually comes because the bots go out and they receive their command and then they come back with the command. Uh, in earlier days, it was an uh, inner relay chat, an IRC channel that was the communication, but it can be a number of things. So all the bots, uh, they're sitting there, and when they get the marching orders, they all do something together, like they all typically do a denial of service attack or something else. Um, or nowadays, it's very common for the bots, instead of doing denial of service, to um, use the bots to use the local CPU power to mine bitcoins. So anyway, uh, bot, that is your machine that's been turned into 
a drone, a zombie of the, uh, the um, evil army, so to speak. Okay, so elements of information security. We want to try to keep the organization safe from theft, tampering, or destruction of its information services. So we need to have the CIA triad. We need to have confidentiality, integrity, availability, and we need authenticity. Authenticity, of course, is a key part of integrity. Um, but authenticity also has an extra element. It means this thing came from the person who claims to have published it. It's authentically from Microsoft. It is a genuine copy of Windows. It is authentically from that developer. It's an authentic copy of something. So uh, you could quite honestly have things that are not authentic, but have not been changed, so they've maintained their integrity. So you want to have things authentically come from the original company, developer, source, vendor, whatever it is, and not be changed, not be modified in an unauthorized way. And then finally, non-repudiation, as we said, the inability to deny that you did something. I can't deny I did something because typically I, um, it's done by digital signature. We'll get to that in cryptography. So, okay, we want to um, have security and functionality and usability all together. It's no good having a system that no one can use. So it needs to have security, it needs to have good features or functionality that we care about, and it needs to be usable altogether. So this is a balancing act, and it's always security against everything else. So we want functionality with good available features. We want it to be usable, easy to use, easy to help others to use. Um, and of course, we want the security restrictions. The whole key is balance. And of course, the more security, the less usability, and the less functionality. So that's our starting. Now let's move on to the next topic.